Oh, baby. I think it's happening. I think it's happening. Hey, hey, if you guys can hear me, let me know in the chat so we know things are working. Colin, you want to say hi? Make sure people can hear you. Hey, everybody. Ooh, that's a I'm nice I'm giving voice. you my late night FM, AM. One well, of those. One of the, frequency modulation, mm -hmm. amplitude modulation, radio DJ voice. Ah, yeah. Coming to you live from Southern California. <laughs> that, that beautiful, sexy voice. What's going on, everybody? Hey. Hey, hey everybody. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm so excited to, uh, to have Colin here and I think we're just making sure everything's all good. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and somebody wants to hit this for me once I get over there and then I'll do a little, uh, I'll, I'll say hey for a minute and then we'll, yeah, it'll just be seen. So I think we're good. Hello everybody. Hope you can see and hear me. Let, let us know in the chat. Make sure uh, everything's good. I want to make sure everything's nice and beautiful before we uh, invite Colin on. So, uh, hey, I'm so excited, you guys. Uh, if you don't know, um, the sweet, wonderful, amazing uh, Colin Kelly was not available to come up to Portland for ResolveCon, and it was like a dagger in my heart. And uh, <clears throat> so me and Dan, we were talking, and we're like, you know, not in our house. Not today, not any day. We're uh, we're we're gonna make this right. We're gonna go and uh, see our friend, see our friend Colin, and uh, do a stream anyway. So, I uh, I called up Colin and was like, Hey man, do you uh, do you maybe want to give that ResolveCon presentation, and uh, we'll just come over and, and stream from your place? And he said, Not really. Just kidding. He said yes. So that's why we're doing it. Does that make sense? So are we good. Are we. Feel, feel good on this. Is this one, is this thing rolling? Do we, do we do that? Should, should do that. Awesome. Cool. Well, um, if we, if we are good on all accounts, then I will, uh, I will hand it over to Colin. Guys, if you don't know, uh, Colin Kelly, he is a, um, we, are you, okay. <clears throat> I know that, are, are you technically a color scientist? I am a published color scientist. He's a published color scientist, uh, as well as an amazing colorist and just all around good guy. I've learned a ton of color stuff from him. Anything that sounds smart that I say about color, I probably just borrowed from Colin Kelly. So uh, if you're into color, this is a real treat. Uh, this is The Secrets of Elite Colorists with Colin Kelly, the ResolveCon presentation uh, coming live to you from California. Colin, come on up here. Everybody give him a hand. Yay, good job, Colin. All right, man, take it away. Thanks, buddy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be with you guys. I was very, very excited to give this talk during ResolveCon. Circumstances cruelly conspired against me, wasn't able to be there. So I was really, really happy when Casey and Dan said, hey, we'll bring the party to you. Uh, so really, really excited to be talking to you guys today. I feel uh, a little out of my element because all at once I'm in my space, I'm in my room, I'm at my desk in a slightly different configuration from the normal configuration. By the way, how do you guys like the set? Does it look cool? Does it look like we're at ResolveCon? I really like it. I think it's awesome. Um, I'm actually in my regular good old space at my regular good old desk, comfortable zone there, but I'm on Casey's channel. So I feel like this whole other, you know, like onus to actually show up and bring quality information to you guys. And as you can see, we're actually starting on time today, which is somewhat of a rarity on uh, my channel. But anyway, I'm really glad to be here with you guys. I'm a little bit nervous because I'm in someone else's house, as it were. And unlike ResolveCon last year, I don't get to look out into the audience and uh, see everyone smiling and nodding or shaking their heads and going, what is this guy talking about? So send me lots of good vibes through the camera lens today so that I know that you're following along and uh, loving what we're talking about. All right, enough nonsense, enough hijinks, enough introduction. Let's talk about what I'm here to talk about with you guys today. I wanna to talk about the secrets of elite colorists. And I'll give you a little bit of context for how I came up with this idea and why I wanna talk about it today. One of the cool parts about my job is that in addition to being a client-facing colorist, providing color grading services to filmmakers and creatives, I do lots of other stuff in the motion imaging world. Casey mentioned that I'm an image scientist. I'm an educator, of course. I've got my YouTube channel. Uh, I consult, I coach. I do all kinds of things that 
involve motion imaging and the people who manipulate motion images on a creative basis. One of the many cool aspects of that multidisciplinary sort of fractal uh, practice that I have when it comes to motion imaging is I get to talk to lots and lots and lots of really, really smart colorists. So what we're talking about today are the secrets that I have very, very slowly extracted from those colorists because they can be a little tough to get to open up and even when they do, it can be a little tough to understand what in the world they're talking about because it's such a esoteric and technical field that we are involved in. So what I wanna share with you today is four, maybe five as time permits of the secrets that I've extracted from the world's best colorists, my favorite colorists. And what I wanna to emphasize today, while we are gonna be working in Resolve, I'm gonna be demonstrating everything that we're talking about, the value of what I'm sharing with you today is more in principles than in practices. So I'm gonna show you specific techniques, I'm gonna show you specific examples, but I want you to take each of these four secrets, five as time permits, to heart as principles that you can apply. I wanna challenge you to think about other ways you can apply these secrets than in the exact particular specific way that I'm gonna show it to you here today. Sound cool? I'm really excited to share these things with you guys. Let's dive in. So, first thing I wanna talk about, I've had conversations with a lot of colorists over the years about like what role should color science play in the practice of a highly effective colorist? Or to put it more simply, do I need to know color science? And that's a question that I get asked all the time and I think there's a really simple answer to it. The short answer is no, you don't need to know color science. The longer answer is no, but someone does. So something that I have observed in every elite colorist I've ever had the opportunity to spend time with, some of them are highly knowledgeable about color science. Some of them have an enviable knowledge of and experience with color science. Others know basically nothing. They're like, you just give me my control surface, you give me a reference monitor, and I will give you beautiful images. So you can really run the gamut there. But the point I wanna emphasize here is that while you do not need to know color science, someone does. So if that's not you, you need to have someone around you who knows color science. Now, if you're one of these elite colorists who I'm talking about, that might be in the form of working at a high-end post facility where you actually have an entire department of color scientists you can collaborate with and reach out to and ask for stuff and ask them to help you build things. Or you may be working in some other capacity. But what, what I want you to think about today is the idea that while you may not need to know color science, someone needs to know color science. The cool news for all of us, whether or not you are one of those small handful of colorists who are working at a large facility and working with color scientists, whether or not you fall into that category, we're in a real renaissance in terms of the color science that is freely, openly available to the average curious colorist uh, who's grading in Resolve or even some other platform. So there's all kinds of interesting color science resources available out there. I'm gonna give you one example right now. I've got a timeline prepped here of uh, a couple different images that we're gonna be going through. But as a starting point, I wanna do something that I do at the beginning of virtually every project that I tackle, which is to set an overall look. And just to quickly summarize what I mean when I say that, I mean something more specific than the way that all the images are rendered. That's just shorthand for color grading, essentially. I'm using look in a bit more of a specific context. What I mean when I say look is a macro level creative transform, or essentially a set of creative preferential manipulations to my image, which do not change. They stay the same shot after shot after shot. And uh, in the uh, language of one of my all time favorite movies, The Big Lebowski, one of the many benefits of a look is that it really ties the room together, just like the dude's rug, okay? So that's what I'm talking about when I say a look. A good look is one of the things that actually distinguishes the, these elite colorists from uh, those of us who have not logged as many flight hours, don't have as much experience. So if you can get a good look in place, you've got a huge head start to uh, being really successful in your color grading practice. And you can have a really good look, you can have access to it, even if you are not ready to bite off learning color science and learning look development, which some of you may have heard me talk about before, are indeed separate disciplines. They are related disciplines, but it's sort of like the uh, analogy that I like to make, it's the difference between being able to play the guitar, that's a colorist, versus being able to build a guitar. Just because you can play the guitar well doesn't mean you can necessarily build it and vice versa. So if you are not yet in the business of building guitars, the cool thing is you still have access to really well-built instruments, even if you are not in some sort of insider privileged position. So I'm gonna give you an example of that right now. I've got these five images here, and right now they're all just color managed in the way that I color manage everything. There's lots of great content uh, on my channel that you can check out if you wanna get read up on color management and the way that I'm doing that. But right now I'm essentially just looking at 
technically sound reproductions of these images, okay? So there's really not any creative character. Certainly no co uh, color grading has been done yet, but if I want to impart that first line of defense of creative manipulation, that macro level creative transform that's gonna thread all my images together on top of whatever localized color grading I do, I could go looking for a LUT. And I could go looking for a LUT that operates in a color managed context and works within my color management pipeline. And the way I'm gonna do that in this case is I'm gonna go into my LUT folder, I'm gonna go into my CKC folder, I'm gonna go into the PFE subfolder, that's short for print film emulation. And what I'm gonna pull up in this case is my Fuji 3510, DaVinci Wide Gamut to DaVinci Wide Gamut LUT. This is a free download that uh, you can grab that is going to slot right into your DaVinci Wide Gamut color managed workflow. And as you can see, this is a preferential manipulation of my colors. I'm just going to each of the images in my timeline and turning this off and on. And you can see it's giving me some vibe. It's giving me some creative character. I hope you like it because I made it, but I really like it. So regardless of uh, whether we agree on the exact aesthetics, my point is that these type of resources are out there and more openly available than they ever have been before. Certainly way more so than when I was learning my craft when this kind of color science, the kind of color science and look development chops that drive looks like this Fuji 3510 emulation, they really were uh, gonna, gonna be boxed out to most of us unless you were working at one of these high-end facilities that I've mentioned. So to summarize this first secret, it's the idea of color science as something that you can choose to bite off and, and try to master uh, as I've been trying to for many years or not. You don't necessarily need to, but if you choose not to, you need to find someone or a resource close to you that does facilitate good color science, that provides you with good color science. It's one of the big secrets. I have never met an elite colorist who does not either have a strong personal knowledge of color science or who is not availing themselves of a nearby person or team who has a really strong knowledge of color science. So however you build that, that's up to you. That's up to your particular circumstances, but you want to avail yourself of good color science as one of your first lines of defense in consistently and quickly mastering beautiful images, okay? So that's my color science pitch to you guys. What's next? Here's another one that was like a huge light bulb for me when I finally started to watch really good colorists up close in detail, grading shot by shot through a timeline. We live in this era now where like, I don't know about you guys, if we were all in the room together, I would ask for a show of hands right now. How many are colorists or want to be full-time exclusive colorists? How many of you guys are editors? How many of you guys are filmmakers that just want to master different images? I'm sure there are different uh, types among us uh, here in this room today, okay? But regardless of your exact relationship with the craft of color grading, we all live in this sort of like Instagram culture, and I don't mean uh, like social media culture in general, I mean as visual artists, a lot of us use Instagram as a way of conveying our art. It's a portfolio outlet, essentially, right? And because we all live in this environment, we are used to seeing the five most eye-catching, most mouth-watering images from whatever the last piece of work that whomever that person is did, right? So if it's a DP, if it's a colorist, if it's a director, whomever it is, we're used to seeing like the five most popping, beautiful images from the work that they did. And one of the biases that this introduces is the idea that all images should hit an 11. All images should pop, all images should blast. And the reality is that's not always true. And if we insist on it being true, we're gonna run into problems. Let me give you an example of this. So we're now operating underneath this Fuji 3510 LUT that I set up at the timeline level of my node graph. I'm now gonna go over to the clip level of my node graph and we're gonna do a little bit of color, color grading. So let's look at this second image here. I'm gonna to try to get this as big as I can for you guys, like so. And this is an image that, I'm gonna make up a word for you guys, you ready? Popability. This image has high popability, all right? So if I just go in and do some basic adjustments, I'm just gonna maybe open up my exposure a little bit. I'm gonna to go to my contrast ratio node, just increase my contrast pivot, try to get the image popping a little bit more. That's popping. And now I'm gonna go over to my balance node and I'm just gonna push some warmth into this image, like so. Finally, I'm gonna go down to a saturation node that I've got set up down below, and we're gonna to try to pop those colors. Just really get, kind of max out the color separation, get lots of good color going on here. Let me just double check something here. By the way, I'm operating in the HSV space with channels one and two turned off. If you got no idea what I'm talking about, that's cool. I talk about it a lot on my channel, but essentially I'm using a different form of saturation than simply reaching for my saturation knob, all right? 
Let's go up here and maybe just do a little bit more exposure. So as promised, I started with an image that felt pretty poppable. And if I go full screen here and I go off and then on, I've been able to very quickly pop this image. This is one of those images that is kind of in my mind's eye when I refer to that like gallery of those five uh, Instagram images that are popping up, okay? It's a poppable image. That's great when those images come up. They're a lot of fun for us to color grade. Let's now go to the next shot in this timeline. Here we have a different shot. Now, just for the sake of argument, let's try to pop this shot. Let's try to give it a similar treatment to what I did before, which if I were to kind of like thumbnail everything that I just did, I basically like increase the exposure or rather increase the contrast and increase the saturation, like maybe mess with the exposure a little bit, but it's really just add contrast, add sat. Really good recipe for popping an image, right? But let's see what happens if we try that here. I feel like exposure actually feels pretty good. I'm gonna try turning my contrast to the right, even though like it almost immediately feels like it's kind of starting to gum up if I look at like the shadows, like they're getting kind of clumpy. And I'm gonna go full screen with this in a minute so you guys can see that a little more easily. Yeah, we don't love clumpy shadows. That's not necessarily, those, those aren't my sounds. What's the, what's the visual equivalent of that phrase? That's not my pixels. And then if we go over here to our balance, you know, like maybe we can optimize that in some kind of direction, I don't know. Not much to be done there. And then let's just go down to the sat node and kind of repeat what I was doing before. So this is me trying, like I'm kind of, I'm, I'm being like uh, a, I'm being my own client in my mind right now and going like, okay, I want you to get the same level of pop that you had here on this shot. This is me trying that. And if we go full screen here and go off and then on, we're committing one of the biggest sins in color grading. This is like a free tip that you can take away that's really gonna help your color grading. If you ever turn everything off and there's anything about the before that you like better than the after, wipe it out and start over because we don't wanna be in the business of trading a little bit of good with, to get a little bit of bad along the way. We want everything to be a value add. So just the example that I come up with here is like, okay, I don't know, like maybe it's a little more snappy, but something about it like feels harsh, like the skin tone no longer feels naturalistic. I'm almost wondering if we're starting to skew kind of like purpley, indigo-y in a way that I'm not loving. There's plenty going on in this after that I don't like even though I'm basically just following the playbook of what I was doing here in this image, okay? So this is another secret of elite colorists. Not all images are going to pop at an 11. And if you try to make them all worthy of your Instagram feed, you're gonna end up having a real challenge getting images to match against one another in the context of like cutting narrative. And you're also just gonna end up with images that don't look very good. Because the reality is I've looked at this image and instead of saying, what does this image need? What does this image want? What is going to be ideal for elevating this image into its ideal form? I'm trying to apply a script based on something I saw in another shot. So this is a good counter example of uh, sort of like failing to observe this wisdom, okay? Here would be like the other way of going about it. I'm just gonna grab a still of this and let's just go ahead and wipe everything out. So we're gonna go kind of back to zero on things. And I haven't necessarily rehearsed this, guys, but I'm just gonna look at this image and try to assess more like, okay, what do I see? Where are the visual opportunities? What do I feel like this image needs? So I'm just gonna kind of work through intuitively here and adjust my exposure, maybe bring it in a little bit, maybe play with this contrast ratio. We're gonna talk about more nuanced ways to manipulate tonality in just a moment, but for now I'm just gonna to stick to my contrast pivot, which is indeed my go-to. I'm gonna go here to my balance. One thing that I'm seeing in this image that I do feel like is an opportunity is like it's skewing cool. It's always gonna skew cool. We've got like just the environment, like the, the whole vibe of it. It's already skewing cool. So I'm just gonna try like leaning into that. Like don't try to fight it. Don't try to like get this massive separation of skin tone against background. Like not all images need or want that. So I'm gonna try kind of cooling this off a little bit like so. And then if we go over here to our sat node, I'm gonna take a much gentler touch. like more like something like that. And then if we do one more node, I'm just gonna do kind of a trim node here. Maybe drop my gamma, bring up my lift, a little bit more like that. I'm just kind of finessing tonality to make the image feel good unto itself, if that makes sense, as opposed to trying to make it match a vibe. Let's pull up our scopes here. I just wanna get a reality check. This, by the way, is how I use scopes. This is how the colorists I admire use scopes. I've been grading scope free so far. I'm just looking at the image and going like, ah, is it skewing like maybe a little pinky purple? And that is sort of proving out when I look at my vector scope. I'm just gonna turn on my skin tone indicator here. So I'm just gonna audition, kind of moving a little bit west with this, like so. We'll go before and then after, maybe a little bit more, maybe 
bring things a little more south as well. I'm just kind of feeling my way to a good result. This connects up to a couple of other things that we're going to talk about later on today. But if we look at like what I've just kind of like felt my way to here in this version of things, let's go full screen and let's wipe to where we were before. So like there's more contrast here. This is actually the first version that I did. It actually is a more eye-catching image. Like if I'm walking past a TV in a hotel lobby, I'm probably going to get more grabbed by this image than by this one. But that doesn't mean this image is better. That doesn't mean this is the better treatment for this image. It's all contextual. It all depends on creative intent. It all depends on the needs of the shot. So I'm going to pitch to you, at least to my eye, taking a more mellow, nuanced, moody, mysterious approach to grading this shot is netting me a stronger form of this shot's ideal state than I'm getting here, which just kind of feels like someone's like slapping a bunch of things on top of it. So example, counter example of what happens when you try to treat every shot like it belongs in your Instagram feed. Uh, the reality is not every single shot needs to be at an 11. And if you try to put it to an 11, you're going to end up with most of your shots feeling kind of weird. Okay. All right. Here's another one. We actually kind of backed our way into this next one. Whoops. My desk is adjusting right now. I need that to go where it was. Can you guys see the little bottom of the monitor moving yeah. there a little bit? <laughs> I feel like I, I, I'll have everyone know I like had to very strongly resist the urge to do like, like an Austin Powers intro yeah. of like <laughs> coming up for <laughs> all this kind of business. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe next year. Um, so we actually kind of backed our way into this next point that I want to talk about. I'm going to throw some terms at you guys. A term that has become very fashionable and like a very important like visual priority uh, that I hear a lot in color grading circles these days is separation. Everybody's about separation, right? We want to get more color separation or separation in general in our image. Other terms that are more or less synonyms for the same things would be like color contrast or color harmony. We're basically trying to make clean separation, like a really les legible image where we can see the distinctions between the colors and the tones in our image. Separation gets talked about a lot. Something that does not get talked about a lot that I think is just as important for an image is something I'm going to call smoothness. Okay. Smoothness. So we got sep on one side, we got smoothness on the other side. And that's what I want to talk about next. So let's look at an image like this. This one is a good example to me because like out of the box, all we've done so far is like turn on this Fuji 3510 and like just keep, I'll, I'll, I'm going to keep pitching this uh, look to you guys for those who aren't already bought in. Like here's the before, there's the after. That's a really nice look. I really like what it's doing there. But the reason I wanted to highlight this image as an example of separation versus smoothness is like we've already got lots and lots of separation in this shot. So what I've learned from elite colorists over the years is now, when I land on a shot like this, I'm not looking at it like, oh, what can we do to really, really punch up that separation and max out that separation? There's really good separation in here already. Subject is well separated from background. Colors are well separated from one another. It's a popping rich image already. So my head is immediately going to pivot more to how can I create smoothness in this image? So let me give you an example of kind of how that would go. Everything about this so far, like let's just say all of my normal steps that I kind of worked through in our first few examples. Exposure feels good. Contrast ratio feels pretty decent as a starting point. Color balance, I don't have anything to say about that right now. All that stuff is pretty good. Maybe I'm looking at the saturation and going like auditioning, adding a little bit more juice in there. So like here would be the before and the after. Like sure, that's fine. Maybe that makes it a little bit more enticing. But the main thing that I want to focus on now is creating some more smoothness. I actually think if we shift our thinking to the tonal side of things. By the way, another great tip, if you are trying to figure out where to spend your time, spend your effort, focus your attention when you're color grading, 10 times out of 10, if you're torn between like color versus tonality, focus on tonality. Our eyes are more sensitive to tonality. You can have an image that has really good feeling exposure and contrast, but it's kind of shaky on the color balance and it can fly. The opposite is not true. If you have an image that's perfectly color balanced, but it feels really thin in the shadows, or like the exposure's off by like a half of a stop, that's going to bump every single time. So put your money on tonality at the end of the day, okay? But tonality is exactly what I'm concerned with here, where I feel like this is all fine, but I actually want to, in a sense, reduce the separation in this image. I want the tones, as I go from blacks to mid-range to highlights, to feel a little bit more connected and integrated. 
So I'm going to do that basically by intuitively working my lift, my gamma, and my gain. So watch this. I'm going to open the lift way up. Now I'm going to drop the gamma way down. And then I'm just going to kind of touch the gain preferentially to manipulate it. And I'm going to start A-Bing. So before, after. I'm just creating a little more depth and a little bit less separation, as I said, than I had a moment ago. But if we go full screen here, off and then on. This is the type of adjustment that's probably going to challenge uh, the uh, restraint or the, the, the uh, constraints of like doing a live Zoom. But if we're all sitting in the room together, I feel like even more so than you might be seeing over uh, not Zoom, YouTube, um, you're going to see what I mean that like creating that sense of connection as you're going from deepest shadows up to dark shadows, up to your mid ranges and up to your highlights, kind of going through like the Ansel Adams zones if anyone is coming from a photography background and creating connection and fluidity between those things, that is something that is just as important as separation to me, especially when you've already got separation. Like there are other shots where like, man, if I don't have any separation, that's bad. You need separation in your image because if nothing is separated, nothing is legible. If an image can't be read, it is not a very pleasing image to look at. So separation is important, but you want to balance the priorities of creating separation in your image with, with creating smoothness in your image. This is one example of that where like, in addition to like setting exposure and contrast and everything else, I will often just go in, play my lift, my gamma, and my gain against each other until I feel like I've created a more integrated image. Maybe a little bit softer would be uh, a valid term to throw out, but more than anything, I want to feel that connection from shadows up through middle ranges all the way up to my highlights. This is an example of carrying both priorities simultaneously. I'm trying to create separation, but I'm also trying to create smoothness. By the way, another good note just to uh, call out as we're going along here, I've effectively, like it's a little more complicated than saying, oh, have I reduced or increased my contrast? Like if you look at this image going off and then on with this adjustment, and you look at the histogram down below, you could sort of like overall summarize that and say that you have reduced contrast somewhat. You can see it in the histogram too. And since I have somewhat reduced contrast, even though it's not quite as straightforward as that, um, generally what you're gonna see when you reduce your contrast, you're gonna lose saturation. When you increase contrast, you are going to increase saturation. That's something that's really helpful to be aware of because sometimes that's not a problem. Sometimes that nets you into exactly the spot you wanna be. Other times you can have the experience I'm having a little bit right now, which is like, well, I feel like, you know, you can even see on my vector scope here. When I A, B this node, I'm losing a little bit of saturation, like the signal mass of the vector scope. It's a little bit smaller post adjustment where I feel like I would at least like to audition. What would it look like if that didn't shrink at all? So I'm going to counter in my saturation node a little bit. And now we're really starting to get what I'm talking about. Like, can you guys see what I mean here before and then after we bumped up the saturation, but there's just more connection between the tones of this image. So, Really good example of what I'm talking about, where you want to sort of weigh both of those priorities in your mind. Separation, everyone knows you want to get separation. You want to make sure you do that, but you also want to get a sense of smoothness in your image. That's something I see like in every colorist I admire, there's a feeling of connection of smoothness in the tonality of their images, okay? All right, here's another really fun one. This is one that uh, I took a long time to learn for myself. I'm gonna sip my coffee. Drum roll, please. Here's the fourth one. It does not need to be right. If you came from the background that I did, if you've come into color grading the way that I did, you're, the first exposure to color grading that you likely got was probably under the banner of color correction, right? I remember going all the way back to like Final Cut Pro 7 and messing around with the three-way color corrector. That was my first exposure to those wheels and to the uh, you know like color trackballs in the center. And I really learned like how to generally get images looking better than they did before with Final Cut Pro 7's color corrector. But my whole like entry point for motion image mastering for creative color grading like I do today was through the banner or under the banner of color correction. And long after I realized that that's not maybe the best description for what I do and that's not really where my value is as a colorist, there can be these lingering ideas that stick around and there's lingering ideas that I think stick around in our culture because of this term and because of the history of color correction. One of these lingering ideas is you need to get it right. You need to correct the image. The image needs to be balanced. I'm talking about rules of thumb like, oh, your shadows need to be black and your highlights need to be white. 
Here's the wisdom that I want to share with you guys today. It does not need to be right. It needs to feel right. This is something every elite colorist I've ever spent time with understands. They don't care about the vector scope. They don't care about the rules that we all had beaten into us, at least my generation and any generation of colorists older than me. We all had some old colorist, some older senior colorist saying, you need to do it this way. This is the correct way to do it. If you don't do it this way, you are breaking the rules of color correction. We all have those voices in our head and the really, really accomplished among us have learned to go, nope, that's wrong. I don't need to be right. I need to feel right. So let me give you an example of that. Let's take a look at this image here. If I look at this image here, I am conditioned to this day. I'm like, you know, like, 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 like a, a dog trained as a puppy. I'm conditioned to look at this and go, oh, it's too warm. I need to balance that out. Whites aren't white. Need to balance it out. And I'll show you, like, I have this workflow seared into my mind. By the way, if you are looking to balance things out and get your neutrals neutral, this actually is a really good workflow. So uh, not a total waste what I'm about to show you. Here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to add a saturation uh, adjustment downstream in an empty node here. Pull my saturation to zero. You can see in my vector scope, I'm actually not quite at zero. For the geeky among us, anyone know why that is? Answer to yourselves. Think about it. It's this. It's my look. My look's making sure that even when there's no color, there's still color, which is kind of a cool, uh, kind of a cool flex. Thanks, 3510. But regardless, we're close enough to desaturate it for my purposes here. I've pulled all the color out. I'm going to grab a still. I'm going to delete that node. And now I'm going to wipe. And I'm going to look at something that I expect should be white, like this highlight on this piece of furniture back here. I can reasonably expect was actually white or close to white in the scene, even though it is not being rendered white currently. And this is a workflow. I can't tell you how many shots I've balanced this way. So I'm going to go full screen here. And I'm basically just going to try to get that white thing white. And this was like how I learned to color correct, basically. And if I want to go a little bit further, I can look at the wall above that piece of furniture and say, well, that should actually kind of be neutral as well. So now I can start working both sides of the equation and try to get that wall and the couch matching somewhat. And this is the way that I was kind of like taught to get things into a level position. I'm going to go something like that without getting too fixated on getting it perfect. How often do you do this wrong and then reset it? Three or four times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's not the right direction. Yeah, totally. So we've got that. And now I've got the, the, the highlight and the shadow are kind of behaving. I'm just working, by the way, my lift and my gain in order to make that happen. So I've now got, theoretically, underneath this wiped image, I've got a balanced image. Turns out I went way too pink with it. So even if I sort of like just use that as my baseline and say like something more like this would be an acceptable, like quote unquote neutral version of the image. In this case, I just have to say like that doesn't even look right. Like it feels weird. But even if it looked right, what would the point be if it didn't feel good? My argument would be like, well, I don't know if somebody made a mistake or maybe the camera was rated like intentionally offset from the color temperature of the light source. I don't really know. I don't know the full genesis. If you were hanging out with me, if this was your image and we were grading it together, I would ask. I would ask about your creative intent because that's the other thing that the color correction mentality just completely steamrolls. What if I don't want it to be right? What if I want it to be wrong? What if I'm Gordon Willis shooting The Godfather and I want it three stops underexposed? Take the average generation of colorist who I learned from and The Godfather would look like a sitcom because there is no such thing as creative intent. There's no such thing as doing it wrong on purpose. There's only such thing as getting it right. Um, so in this case, like my whole pitch would be this actually looks better in this state. And I think a more fun question to ask is not how do I correct this to some sort of arbitrary neutral, but actually how do I, how do I assume like this is kind of a tangent. I went to film school many years ago and I had uh, a teacher who emphasized to everyone who wanted to write and direct movies. And at the time, I kind of thought maybe that's the direction that my career was going to go. They emphasized to everybody who wrote and directed movies, they're like, there's a thing you need to do when you're writing and directing movies that is really hard. You have to write it, and then at a certain point, you have to treat your own script, your own words, warts and all, as if they were handed to you on stone tablets by you know, like Jesus himself. You have to treat those words as sacred. You have to go through the imaginative exercise of going, what if every single punctuation mark and word in this script is sacred and beautiful and within it contains secrets to making a beautiful movie? 
And I really feel like there's an analog to be made for that with color grading. I try to embrace that when I'm looking at images. I'm like, what if there were no mistakes? What if my clients did not make any mistakes? What if all of them are opportunities waiting to be revealed and unlocked? So when I look at an image like this, my first thought, even if the client is betraying a guilty conscience saying like, oh, I messed up the ISO or I messed up the Kelvin on that, my question is often like, what if you didn't? What if this is really interesting? We should at least explore that direction. So rather than trying to level this out, what I would probably do with a shot like this, at least as a first crack, is I would probably try to lean into it. And here's a really good trick for like, let's say we want to get even more of this warmth in here than we have already. I'm going to go over to my custom curves and instead of using my trackball to balance the image, I'm going to go to my custom curves so that I can work sort of subtractively. And what I'm going to do is start subtracting blue from this image, like so. And now I'm going to go over to my green channel, subtract a little bit of green as well. What's left if I'm subtracting some blue and a little bit of green? I'm getting some sort of reddish, orangish, yellowish color, right? So I'm going to do that basically to ensure that the image isn't getting hotter as I add this color to it, like so. And now I'm going to follow my own advice that I gave a little while ago, which is not to snooze on the tonality of the image. So let's go and trim our exposure in a little bit. Let's look at the contrast ratio. Maybe bump that up. Maybe leave that be and go straight to the technique that we were talking about before of just kind of like working our ranges against each other. In this case, I'm going to roll my high end, my gain, way in, and then bring my gamma up because I want to feel some roundness in those highlights, like so. And then maybe drop the blacks uh, in the, using my lift wheel to try to get a little bit more vibe there. So trying to like really, really get those highlights feeling more gentle and get the shadows behaving as well. I'm just freehanding here, but something like that. And then if we go over to our saturation knob again, I'm gonna go in and work my gamma within here. That's gonna give me even more of that warmth because we're already up inside of that quadrant. And my question would be like, is this an interesting direction? I could even make a case for like, maybe we'll go downstream and here's just a little bonus thing as we get toward the end of our secrets here. I'm just gonna to go to my exposure chart for a moment. I'm gonna pull up a DaVinci Wide Gamut Gray patch here. This is also a free download, this exposure chart DCTL. I'm using it right now to find middle gray and to place a control point there. And I'm just wondering, I've not, and now that I've got that control point, I can remove this completely. And I'm just wondering if it wouldn't be interesting to pump just a little bit of blue down into the low end of the image. Maybe add a little bit of green down in there as well. So I've got like just this little bump of kind of color counterpoint here. Now we're getting a little bit more like this is separ uh, yeah, separation uh, as we talked about before. So there's totally room for that, but I'm doing that after having really made the effort to add smoothness in here. You see my before and after on this? This is a good example again of like, okay, like yes, in broadest summary, you have reduced the contrast of the image, but I'm really not thinking about increased or reduced contrast. I'm thinking about smoothness. So if we look at this, like let's look at everything that I've done just kind of freehanding here. There's our before, there's our after, and then let's wipe to like the corrected version that we were playing with a moment ago. Oh, silly me, I guess my still has disappeared on me there. We'll have to imagine in our mind's eye that boring, balanced correction that we had uh, a moment ago when we were grading. Not nearly as interesting as what we have here. And we can go anywhere we want from here. We could say like, ah, you, that saturation thing, you don't need it so much. Or like, maybe we do want to go back over to our balance and look at, you know, letting it pull a little bit more neutral. But I'm doing that by eye. I'm doing that based on what I find appealing. I'm doing that based on trying to create separation in my colors like we talked about a moment ago. And I'm doing it based on how can I flatter my subject, the people in the frame, as well as the overall image, as opposed to some sort of like false notion or like preconceived notion of making sure that it's correct. And really to be honest with you guys, like in my case, I can't speak for others, but I think for a, a lot of us, what we're doing when we try to correct an image in the way that I'm talking about, of like, oh, make sure the whites are white and the shadows are, are uh, you know, like neutral. Someone told us that at some point. Someone probably made us feel dumb because we didn't do that. So now we're just trying to make sure that we don't look dumb in front of everybody. Like I can't tell you how much of my color grading practice in my early years was motivated by not wanting to look foolish or stupid or like I'd forgotten something important in front of the people I was working with. But as we can probably all intuit, that's a terrible place to make cool creative stuff from. So I'm gonna encourage you in this last secret, 
It does not need to be right at all. There is no objective right. It needs to feel right. Making it feel right is messy and nonlinear, and it is collaborative. It's something that you do in collaboration with the creative stakeholders who you are partnered with, all right? And since we've got just another minute here, let's throw in a bonus point because it really connects right up to what I just said. This last secret that I want to talk to you about, this one is hard to demonstrate. It's really hard to demonstrate because I almost need like one of you guys to come sit here in the room with me and I need us to talk about what we see in a shot and what we want to see in a shot. But the secret that I want to leave you with is that the journey matters. What do I mean when I say that? What I mean is that if you spend any amount of time color grading, whether you're trying to be a professional colorist, whether you're just trying to grade your images that you've shot more effectively, whether you're an editor and you're trying to uh, increase your value to the people who you're working with, whatever your application for working inside of Resolve is, if you spend any amount of time at it, you're gonna start to develop an instinct that I've probably demonstrated to you guys a little bit today. You land on an image, you go, okay, I know what that needs. I know where it needs to go. It needs to be a little bit more open. It needs to be a little bit more softer in the shadows. It needs a little bit more separation in the high end. You're gonna develop knee jerks that you're like, I know what this needs. It might happen really fast. I might be able to like push a button and get there, or I might have to mess around with it, try it two or three times like uh, Casey and I were riffing about a moment ago, but I know where it needs to go. You're gonna start to develop that, uh, that instinct or that knee jerk. The challenge is, the better you get at that, the easier it is to become a very uncollaborative, unfun person to work with. So when I say the journey matters, I mean that just because I land on an image and I know like in the sake of, uh, or, or in the uh, case of this image, I kind of have a sense that this is where I wanted it to go all along. But if I insist that I know where it needs to go and please stop talking because I'm gonna get this done, I'm not gonna be a very fun colorist to work with. So the journey matters. It's not gonna be linear. It's very, very rarely gonna be the shortest distance between where it is now and where you probably have a very accurate sense it needs to go. You're gonna need to take some twists and turns and detours and stop off for gas and maybe a Coke along the way. And if you can do that and enjoy that and make that enjoyable, that is color grading. Just as much as mastering the image and getting to a great result. There are lots of people who can get an image to a great result. One of the things that really separates the elite colorists who I'm talking about is that they figured that out a long time ago. They figured out how to take the image and make it look better than it did before and make it look more like the client wants it to look. That's kind of a given, that's like a price of admission. But there is no elite colorist I have ever met who isn't an absolute pleasure just to hang out with. Whether we're color grading or not, they're just fun to be around, they're easy going, they don't demand that things go their particular way or that the process work in a particular fashion. They're collaborative, they're open, and they understand that the journey matters just as much as the destination. That's the hardest one to pitch visually here since we're not all hanging out together and I can't bring up one of you guys and say, hey, tell me where you wanna see it go and we can collaborate on it in kind of real time. But that's what I wanna leave you guys with is that the journey matters. So that's my top five secrets that I feel like I've really kind of distilled down the principles from the uh, really great colors who I've had the privilege of hanging out with and stealing from uh, over the years. And I hope you guys are able to put those things into a tangible practice. As I said at the beginning of this conversation, I'm gonna challenge you to take these principles more so than any specific technique I've showed you, although I hope I've showed you some cool techniques. I wanna, I wanna challenge you to take the principles and think about other ways you can apply these principles. Think about other ways that these can impact or alter or transform your practice. I promise the more you let these principles trickle into the way your color grade, the more effective you're gonna be in grading beautiful images, and the more fun you're gonna to be to collaborate with as a colorist. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah, man, that was awesome. Who's in the house, Godali? Anyone I know? Yeah, we've got uh, Tim, we've got Jim Robinson. All right, what's up, guys? Thanks for being here. You guys make me feel at home. Sasha, we've got Frank. All right. My crowd. Other the usuals. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right. You guys, show some love in the chat for, for Colin. This is, uh, dude, that was amazing. Thanks, dude. I, uh, I, learned, I learned a lot, and I, I love uh, just learning principles of things. I mean, it's so, it's so much better than, I, I mean, it's like essential compared to just learning, you know, what knobs to, 
to press and, and everything like that. But um, man, that was so cool. I love I love the uh, I, I lo especially love the last one where you kind of went along where um, where the image kind of feels like it needs to be. You yeah. know, because I mean I'm certainly guilty of that. Uh, feeling like, oh, well, I gotta make whites white and I gotta make blacks black and make sure everything looks correct. And that's like my first step. And now I'll do something creative. Right. And it's like, well, I mean, if you know, if it already feels good, like why are you ruining it first? You know? Yeah, why are you making sure to ruin it first? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's crazy, it's crazy. So we do have some some questions and I'll, I'll pitch to you. And uh, yeah, so uh, Frank asks, when, when do I use the raw tab instead of the wheels? Ooh. Cool question. Yeah, let's talk about the raw tab for a second. Here's going to be my sort of like the conceptual frame that I want to put around the raw tab. The thing to keep in mind is we want, when we're deciding when to use, when, to not, to, when not to use the raw tab, we want to embody the idea of working toward an image-centric practice as opposed to a camera-centric practice. So the biggest challenge of the raw tab, it's not that any slider or drop down is bad or doesn't do good things to the image or does beautiful things to the image. I think the biggest drawback of the raw tab is that it's not a color grading tool. Mm -hmm. It's only available to you for certain raw media. So if I've got a project with red and I've got a project with some ProRes Log C, I can only use the raw tab for the red material. Now, that tells us right off the bat, okay, I don't want to do any of my ground level like lifting with the camera raw tab because I'm gonna have to come up with some sort of improvised solution for the material that won't work with the camera raw tab, i.e. the ProRes, which begs the question, well, why don't you just use that solution across the board, be a little bit more consistent, a little simpler. So that uh, should be fairly obvious. I think the other uh, thing that I'll point out is even in terms of like, oh, well, what if I need to use the raw tab to get some sort of correction that's not available to me once I am in my node graph inside the color page? I'm not gonna like give you an absolute here, but I'll say like a really good general rule of thumb to keep in mind, there is nothing that the camera raw tab can do for you that you cannot accomplish in your node graph. Mm. If you wanna drop your ISO, drop linear gain or your global exposure in the HDR zones. If you wanna change your color temperature, use the temperature knob in the HDR zones, use the chromatic adaptation plugin uh, in your open effects plugins, or just feel your way to a good result with uh, some gain gamma or lift adjustments like we talked about today. So that's the number one thing that I would leave that with is that there's not really anything under most circumstances that's like blocked off to you in the node graph that you're somehow gonna be able to do in the camera raw tab. Now for like individual uh, things like um, changing ISO and that kind of thing, is it any higher quality to do it in the raw tab versus uh, in, in the nodes? Is it like technically better but not that big a deal, or, or is no. it just the same? It's, just, it's literally the same thing. It's just, you've got, you've just got. Just reminds me that everything's a scam. Everything's yep. a scam. Everything's guys. a scam. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's yep. awesome. Okay, so uh, Ray asked, what's the first thing to look at when, uh, what if the initial color is off? How do I get a great starting point prior to the creative work? Oh, I love this question. This is such a good one to talk about. Here's the first thing to look at in an image. You want to like, Images are like, I don't know, they're, they're, it, it's kind of like, like any relationship with a person, like your kids or your friends. You really don't want to start with what needs fixing. You really want to start sure. with like, just, what feels really maybe good. Just, maybe just live with them for a little bit. Yeah, be, exactly. Be cool with that. It's not a strong opener. It's like, well, I tell you your problem. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, Hi, what was your name again? Yeah. yeah. You know what yeah. your problem is? It's, just, it's, it's not a, a super warm and fuzzy. It's a, it's a tough look to own, you sure. know? So I would encourage like, I'm not saying, like, I'm, I'm a realist. Like, there's all kinds of stuff that needs to be tuned and manipulated and finessed when we're grading. But if we're talking about the first thing you look at in an image, like, absolutely, what I'm looking for is, like, where are the opportunities? Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the strongest things about this image? Because the strongest things about this image you can double down on and you can make stronger. Like, if we look at this shot we were on before, there's already this really nice separation between these kind of goldy and bluey colors here in the background. I can double down on that by juicing that sat a little bit further. So you want to look for strong points and opportunities that you can elevate. And then once you do that and you feel like you've exploited the best parts of the image, that's where you can look at like, okay, are there problems? Are there little areas that I need to uh, sort of bring into alignment or go in and fix? But stuff to fix definitely should come second to like, what's strongest about this image? Every image has something that is strongest about it. It doesn't matter how beautiful or compromised it might be. 
<laughs> I love that. Yeah, coming out of coming out of image, image with love and hope. You know, yeah. and that's, that's that's lead with love, man. That's wholesome as heck, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how we should do everything. Um, okay, so how do you handle something like a nature documentary uh, as colors are all over the place? That's a cool question. I mean, I'm not looking at your nature documentary at the moment, but like you certainly, I imagine, have a you could have a large distribution of colors, but there's going to be particular colors that are going to recur a lot in your nature documentary, mm -hmm. right? You're going to be seeing a lot of earth, a lot of dirt, a lot of foliage, probably a lot of sky, right? So those are, by the way, good colors to focus on probably in most projects, but certainly in your nature doc. I would focus, like, if I'm coming at it cold, like a timeline of completely untouched material, first thing I would probably look at is, like, implementing a look that really, really flatters those colors mm. when they're slotted into the right place. You might have a shot that's like, oh, it's way too cool, so you're gonna need to warm that up underneath the look for the foliage and the skies and the earth to like really render the way that they need to. But I would focus on like where the shots are kind of like decently well exposed and they represent kind of the best of the photographic effort of that production. Make sure you're working underneath a look that really, really serves those colors and gives some consistency the way that those colors are rendered. That's again, just a great principle to apply to any project. Like, what are the colors that recur? There may be a super widespread of all kinds of colors of the rainbow, or it might be narrower, but even if there's lots and lots of colors, there's gonna be ones that recur more than others. Mm. So I'd focus on those. How are you flattering and supporting and enhancing those? First at a system, at a macro level, and then how are you underneath that overall look, sort of like positioning those images so that they're hitting the right spot within that macro level look. Yeah, I mean, that's just a smart way to go about I mean, post-production anyway is doing doing the work that's going to serve best the entire project or most of the project, 60% of the project, and then going in and kind of fixing the outliers. Yep. You know, I mean, if you have if if most of your shots have grass and sky, you want to make sure that in your your macro level look, grass and sky looks pretty good. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And then if you have a you know a cabin, you're not going to make everything look, you know, change your, your giant look for everything to make sure that cabin looks good. You're just going to go and fix the cabin things later. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, um, ooh, this is a great, great question. What are some good ways to find mentors, like with you and Mitch Bogdanowitz? Oh, um, I love talking. It doesn't have to be exclusively color, but I know how important it is to have someone you can share work and life with. Oh, man. We were talking about this the other day, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that that's like mentors, as uh, some of you guys may know, like like I place such emphasis on the value of mentorship. Mm. And, you know, like I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to tell Dr. Bogdanowitz I'm about to put him on blast, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll call him out as an example of the most important professional mentor I've had in my life. He has really transformed my color grading practice, having him uh, in my color grading sphere and teaching me. That's a relationship that took seven or eight years to like get him to take me seriously. You're talking about, you know, like one of the, mo probably the most decorated color scientist in the world. And I remember starting to hit him up when I first read his patent filings and being like, wow, that guy's pretty cool. And you're like, hey, I think your work's pretty cool. I've read some of your patent filings. Can I buy you coffee? You know what he said? No, no, I'm retired. I have a farm. I don't, no, I'm not anywhere near LA. Like that's, sorry, I, I, I'm retired, like can't help you. But I just kept with him because I, I knew if I could get this guy to give me the time of day, I just had a sense it was going to transform my practice. I hope that finding mentors is not a seven or eight year process yeah. for all of you guys. <laughs> but I do emphasize like it takes effort, it takes work because you're really asking someone to give you something. Like he, I, I've tried as best I can to repay Dr. Bogdanowitz in favors and in you know like lending what help I can to his efforts and like you know the things that I maybe have unique understanding of but I'm never going to be able to repay the mentorship he's given me oh, he's yeah. given me something you know in invaluable for so sure. like that's you you have to recognize like I'm asking someone to give me something incredibly valuable that I'm not going to be able to give back to them there are not people walking around carrying that looking to give it away for the most part but you can find them and when you do it's worth the effort even if it takes that long yeah that's I, I think one of the things I, I like most about you is you're you're willing to give out that kind of advice and everything. And I mean, I've appreciated your mentorship of me in color stuff for the last last couple of years, man, because it's made a huge difference in, in my work. And uh, it's really cool that you're able to um, turn around and give that to other people. And I mean, in your color classes and everything, it's uh, there's a lot of images being made very nice because you are kind and 
caring and want people to make nice images, man. That's my that's, people. That's really cool. Thanks, man. Oh. Well, and I, I just have to say, too, uh, on, on Casey's part, that we were talking about this literally just the other day. This is something that Casey's really good at. When he finds someone he admires or when he, or he thinks is interesting or wants to learn from or wants to know more about, you're very, like, unbashful about being like, hey, I think you're cool. Like we should be friends. That's I think isn't that your line? That's literally my that, pitch to yeah. you. Like, hey, I think you're cool. You want to hang out? That works. <laughs> that very much works. So, still the Casey's right people, line. it works. People, yeah. people that are that cool, yeah, they'll, they'll do it. Yeah. If not farmers or retired, it works great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Luckily, I'm not interested in farming or retiring, so I think hopefully it'll hopefully it'll be okay. <laughs> oh man. Um, okay, so I think we got we got time for a couple a couple more here. So um, Jim asks, do you ever request or refer to the script to analyze uh, what you're actually grading as far as time of day, geography, setting the scene, et cetera? That's a cool question. I f don't know if I've ever done that. And now I feel like a dummy because I never have, Jim. Have you ever done that? Let me know. That mm -hmm. seems like a cool idea. I've like, definitely read scripts uh, you know, like before our project has even shot and been like, Yes, I'm in. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, but that would kind of be a great idea to refer back and look at like what is the, what does the original author of the story have to tell me? What clues can they offer about how this should look, taste, feel, all of the above? Yeah. Um, I think this was interesting. Uh, do you always work with a reference that you and the client find, or do you freehand a look? I love freehanding looks for sure. Like I, I love when you bring me references because th there's that like. You guys ever heard this? I probably pitched it at some point in uh, our my color grading adventures. But there's that great, I think it's attributed to Elvis Costello usually that talking about music is like dancing about architecture. Sure. <laughs> like talking about color grading is kind of the same thing. It's very slippery stuff. So I love being brought images of like I want it to feel like this, or even like well a, a, another form that it can come in, even if it's not like hey you know like I want it to look like an exact combination of Apocalypse Now and you know, arrival and, you know, like whatever it else. Like, it, like this is the exact data bank or image bank that I want you to pull from. A lot of the time, even if there's not reference images, what I will do is I'll, I'll just try to have an open-ended conversation with the people I'm working with about like, what do you dig? What movies do you like? What shows are you watching right now? Show me some like things you've favorited on your Instagram feed. Like show me your photo library. Just what are the images that you respond to? Because mm -hmm. often, Filmmakers, visual artists, they can't even necessarily tell you. Like, think about how much time we've had to spend cultivating language to describe what we are doing to the yeah. image. Oftentimes, there's not language. They just know what they like when they see it. Yeah. But we can look at that and start to see patterns of like, okay, so you are really into, you like a certain roundness in your highlights, or you're all about texture, and you want to feel grain in the image, or you really prefer a constrained color palette, like whatever it is. We can ID those things and sort of like incorporate them into a look and mirror that back without necessarily making anyone get a degree in like color grading language and lingo. Sure. You know? Yeah. That's nice, nice to have a reference because then you can kind of have a common language without either of you necessarily needing to say the same thing. You yes. can both be like, all right, we like this kind of thing and uh, kind of arrive on that together. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, I thought that was interesting. I really liked the, the part you were talking about. How smooth does it feel? Like the smooth transition between the dark and the light and stuff. Um, I think that's something like I've intuiti intuitively liked about images and like the way that I color grade stuff. Um, and I've never really had a word for it, so that was kind of fun. I'm just like, you know, like you don't want it to be like too, you know, harsh or something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like the smoothness is the. I, I, I've been looking yeah. for that word too. Smoothness, like roundness, is another one that's yeah. like big in my vocab right now. Like it should feel. Like it's all one thing, and there's no hard edges anywhere on. It's like a like you're holding a globe or something. Yeah, you know? yeah. Oh, so cool, Colin. This has been amazing, man. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you for being willing to uh, have us at your place and invite us into your studio and and uh, do this stream with us. Uh, it's been really cool. Thanks, buddy. So, it's been a pleasure. You, I'm really glad we got to do it. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into the stream. Make sure to check out Colin's channel if you're into color and you don't follow Colin. What are you even doing? Like, do you, we, do, do you even color? Like, I mean, it's just, just the dumbest thing I've ever heard of to not do that. <laughs> so, yeah, check out, check out his, uh, his, you do um, weekly streams, right? Yeah, we do, we, we do uh, grade school every Friday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific. And, you know, it's usually an AMA format kind of themed around whatever we've been talking about in the other videos that week. But 
If you've got a question about color grading, if you're working on something, struggling with something, uh, then bring it in and uh, we'll chop it up. We'll talk about it. Yeah, I, I learned so much during those streams, man. I really, really, really appreciate them. And the fact that you're just giving them out for free, man, so good. So good. So yeah, thank you everybody for uh, for tuning in. And again, yeah, make sure to follow uh, Colin. And yeah, we'll see you guys later this week. We have something cool to show you uh, in just a couple days here on this channel. So uh, set your faces to stunned. It's going to be a thing. <laughs> so take care, guys. See you guys. Thanks. I love you. Bye.